good good afternoon everyone thank you for joining again in this session now the second session will be start before we start we will call on the participants for the next session to know if you are ready or not the first miss yuli are you ready bumaya okay thank you miss city yes i'm present miss okay thank you miss niken yes i'm here miss okay thank you miss helviana miss helviana are you there okay miss febriana lulu Ms. Febriana Lulu, are you there? Okay, Ms. Sukma? Ms. Sukma? Okay, uh, Ms. Tilawati? Ms. Tilawati, are you there? Hello, Ms. Tila? Yes, ma'am. Okay, Mr. Raju, Mr. Raju, are you there? Okay, Miss Aina, okay, Miss Mega. Miss Mega, are you there? Okay. Maybe uh, now we can start our presentation today. We, uh, the first session, uh, it's about family support of your with thalassemia. The presenter is Miss Yuli Utami. Okay. Hello everyone, good uh, afternoon. My name is Yuli Utami and you can call me Yuli. I come from Binawan University. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you so much for this great opportunity to attend and also to present our, our research paper in the international conference held by Mitra Keluarga Health Sciences. My research paper is about the family support and self-esteem in adolescents with uh, thalassemia. For this section, we divide into four parts. The first part is talking about the background, the second one about the theoretical review, and the part three about the research method, and the last part is about results and discussion. We move to the background first. Uh, as we know that the 7% of people in the world, mostly the carrier of the thalassemia, it, it is around 300 to 400,000 of children were, were born with major thalassemia. And uh, based on the data, the spread of thalassemia turned to occur in Italian, Greeks, uh, Middle Easterns, 
and Asian and also Africans. It is estimated that the number of people with the thalassemia in Indonesia will increase in 2008 and will reach 20 to 25,000 people. This research was conducted in Chipto Mount Kusumo Hospital. And before we did the research, we had to gather the previous data collected from medical records. And we found that the uh, patient, adolescent with a major thalassemia is, is around 264 uh, adolescents, which, uh, which is aged 10 to 18 years old. Adolescent with thalassemia major who did a regular term fusion often saw psychological reaction and bad experiences. And uh, thalassemia disease, in addition to have an impact on physical condition as well on psychosocial condition. Adolescent with thalassemia with chronic disease are easy to experience emotional and behavioral problem. This is the way, this is um, the reason why the adolescent with the thalassemia need support from their family, friend, and other support system in order to survive with limitation. Adolescents with thalassemia sometimes have a lower self-esteem regarding sickle social, even their performance. So, Magviro in 2014, we comment if there needs to be an effort from hot worker also to have adolescents with the thalassemia to identify a positive as aspect and ability that they have. We should remind them that the best way to make adolescent good is to make them happy. And the next part is the theoretical review. We know that the thalassemia is a genetic disorder characterized by the absence of the Chris one of the global chains, either alpha chain or beta chains, which are main the component of the normal hemoglobin molecule. So this is why the thalassemia, the adolescent with the thalassemia, always have a regular blood transfusion, even in a month or maybe less than month, they always, uh, uh, do this procedure. Talking about the family support is really, really important to adolescents with the thalassemia. Family support is an attitude, action, and acceptance of the family towards family members. Support can be the form of encouragement, attention, appreciation of our care, so that is obtained by a group of individuals who are really the special marriage on our blood ties. The next is about the self-esteem. Your self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Hopefully adolescents with a thalassemia have a high, have an excellent self-esteem. But if they don't, for example, if you have low self-esteem, you don't like yourself. You don't think that you are a valuable person and therefore you do not behave confidently. So the third part is about the methods. In this part, we are gonna talk about the research sampling about the analytical methods, about the number of sample, and also about the analytical tests. We use um, analytical method, correlation analytical with a cross-sectional approach. 
And also to get a sample, we use the purposive sampling. We have that numbers of uh, criteria, inclusion and exclusion to get the good sample. And after we count the number of sample, we determine that the sample is 50 respondents which is the age between 10 to 18 years old. Uh, after that, uh, we give them the questionnaires, the uh, 14 questions for family support and 10 questions for measure the self-esteem. And then after the processing the data, uh, we use the Sperman rank to analyze the data. We wanna, we would like to determine whether the family support have a correlation with the self-esteem. And the, the result will be present in the next slide. Okay, this part is result and discussion. We saw that the family support, we found that the family support was high, that almost 82%, which means that the, the teenage or the adolescent felt they have a good family support. So family support will improve the physical condition that can be uh, manage stress more uh, in valuable manner, productivity and psychological will be. Adolescent with uh, the thalassemia seems to be more confident and calm when they have involved in mentoring program. However, there's still low family support. It is probably related to the developmental age with the work mark and comfortable undergoing treatment with their friends together rather than there with their family member. Okay, we found the frequency distribution about the self-esteem. We found that the, the, the self-esteem have in the middle level, the number is 70, 40%. Most of the respondents have a moderate self-esteem. Self-esteem is a positive or negative evaluation of oneself. The self-esteem of many adolescents with thalassemia who have high and moderate self-esteem means that the self-evaluation is in a positive direction and the value is in the normal range. The next slide is talking about the Result uh, data, the correlation of family support to adolescent self-esteem. We found that the p-value is less than 0, uh, 0.05, which means that the, there is a correlation between family support and the self-esteem. Even the strength of the correlation is lower. The correlation coefficient in is positive, which means the high level of family support given to thalassemia adolescent, the higher the higher self-esteem they have. Family support is really influential in increasing individual self-esteem and the support received by individual is very depend on how who gives the support. There are two main sources that affect individual self-esteem, the appreciation from self and also the appreciation from others. So let's say me, which is a disease that is acquired from birth is if it's not well cared uh, or for handled poorly will have an unfavorable impact on the patient's physical growth, development, and psychological. Therefore, social support is needed to keep the patient's self-esteem positive 
so that it help individual adapt to their illness. There is a low correlation between family support and self-esteem in adolescent with thalassemia. Adolescent is marked by the emotional development, socializing, so that it requires support from the closest environment, such as a family member and friend. Okay, uh, this is the conclusion. And this is the last part of the presentation. Family, my presentation is already done. And thank you so much for the attention and looking forward with the, for the positive feedback. And good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Miss, for the presentation, ladies and gentlemen. Now come to the question and answer session. You can write your name and your institution name at chat column, followed by your question. Maybe we can uh, one or two questions from the participants, please. Maybe one question. Okay, from Miss Melania, what is the impact from lack of support to adolescents thalassemia? Miss Yuli, maybe you can answer it directly. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question from Melania. Uh, actually, the impact of lack of support uh, support adolescents to thalassemia is really disturb the uh, psychological, social, and also emotional. Because most of the need, uh, uh, apa? family support, they have to go to the hospital every month. And sometimes uh, some of them uh, cut, uh, not, not continuing the education because uh, some of them have a lower self-esteem. So, it's really need a family support who will always with the patient, uh, who will always with the uh, adolescent with the tel thalassemia. So uh, it can um, uh, impact on the growth and also the development, especially for uh, psychosocial, psychological development. Okay, thank you Thanks for the answer. The second question from Sinta, has the research been conducted in other countries and does it give the same result too? Thank you. Actually, uh, this research also helped in another, uh, another countries, but maybe uh, different, different between the Asian, uh, between African and also between uh, the de uh, developed countries like um, Australia or UK, that's they have um, what is the systematic uh, support not only for for family support also, but they already have a good development about the uh, the other support from the environment. Uh, they have uh, lots of community really uh, help the teenage, help the adolescents to, I mean, to facilitate their feeling, they can they share their feeling with uh, other friends. Okay, maybe it's the last question from Miss Melania. Besides the psychology impact, is there health issue because of the lack support? 
Thank you. Yeah, there are lots of uh, help issues because uh, uh, blood transfusions always give every month on this body like a uh, black skin and change the face and also uh, the the what is the enlarge the stomach. So uh, it means uh, that. Uh, it uh, makes not only psychological impact but also health impact because the what is the side effect of the uh, long blood transfusion okay thank you miss for the answer and the explanation maybe if there is no question we can watch the next video miss siti are you ready miss siti latifa Yes, thank you, Maya. Yeah, thank you. I'm ready. Thank you, Miss Julie, for the explanation. Now, uh, from Miss Siti Latifa, the topic is about the de determinant of the incident of hypertension in Balikambang Health Center, Bendungan Village, Jonggo, Jonggo Subdistrict in the year 2021. Maybe we can watch the video now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Let me introduce myself. My name is Siti Latifa from Muhammadiyah University of Jakarta. In this opportunity, I would like to present my research result with Mrs. Wati Jumaya with the title of The Determinant of the Incident of Hypertension in Balikambang Health Center, Bendungan Village, Junggul Subdistrict in the year 2021. In the chapter one, which is the introduction, I have divided this part into four sections. The first part is background. Based on the World Health Organization in 2013, hypertension is a condition where a blood vessel has a high blood tension where the systolic blood pressure is equal to or more than 140 millimeter hectogram. On the diastolic blood pressure is equal to or more than 90 millimeter hectogram and is settled. And the next part is research question. Due to the problem stated in research background, the research question of this study is what factors are included in the determinant of hypertension in the incident in Balikamba Health Center? And moving to the purpose, the research in the general purpose and the specific purpose. The general purpose of this research is to know the determinant associated with the incident of hypertension in Balikamba Health Center. And the final part of this chapter is the significance of this research, which is for health service, for institute, and for researchers. Moving to the chapter, which is the literature review. The theory used is hypertension risk factor. Reversible pressure is obesity, alcohol consumption, and sodium intake, and stress. Obesity is one of the risk factors that can cause hypertension, which is, which is a condition where body weight research as a body mass index more than 25 kilogram per square meter and when consuming excessive alcohol in the long term will have an effect on increasing cortisol level in the blood so that the activity of the renin angiotensin and aldosterone increases and causes blood pressure to increase and excessive sodium consumption can result in an increase in intracellular sodium concentration and that's causing hypertension. Frequent or continuous stress can cause hypertrophy of vascular smooth muscle or affect the central integrative pathway of the brain causing an increase in blood pressure. In the chapter three, the chapter three is the research framework. The study used an independent variable in the reversible picture, which is obesity, alcohol consumption, sodium intake, and stress. The independent variable is affecting the dependent variable, which is the hypertension incident. We move to the chapter one, the methodology and data analysis for the research design. This study used a quantitative research with an analytic observational type and using cross-sectional research design to see the determinant of hypertension at Palikamba Health Center in 2021. While the population of this study is responding who visit the Balikamba Health Center from January to March in 2021 with an average 1,605 people per month. And the sample taken from this study is 86 people. And for data 
can use uh, the first preparation pass, the second is implementation stage, and the last is final stage. And for the place of the research in Balai Kambang Health Center on March until July 2021. And move the research etiquette, which is informed consent, and meet the confidentiality and justice. And the next one is the research instru instrument, which is depression and statistical 21, body mass index, and the question are referred to the studies conducted by validity tests and reliability tests. And data analysis for a univariate analysis use descriptive analysis and for bivariate analysis conduct with the chi square test to determine whether there is a relationship between obesity variable alcohol consumption, sodium intake, stress with the incident of hypertension at the Bali Kambang Health Center. <clears throat> In the chapter five, which is the research result, I have divided the part into four table. Uh, based on the table 5.1, it was found the data on the frequency distribution of respondents showed that the majority of respondents age or early elderly as many as 27.6. And gender in the Balkama Health Center, the majority are female as many as 61.6%. And the majority of education at Balkama Health Center have a low education, namely 65.1%. And based on the table 5.2, it was found that on the frequency distribution of respondents based on obesity at the Balikama Health Center were not obese, as many as 76.7%. And the majority of alcohol consumption in Balikama Health Center didn't consume as many as 81.4%. And sodium intake at the Balikama Health Center was mostly high in sodium intake, namely 59.3%. And the stress category at the Balikama Health Center was mostly stressed as many as 51.2%. As and based on the table 5.3, it was found data on the frequency distribution of respondents based on incident of hypertension at Balikama Health Center were the majority of hypertension, namely 52.3%. And based on the table 5.4, based on the result of statistical tests using the chi square test with people value 0.001, it can be concluded that there is a significant relationship between obesity and the incident of hypertension in Balikambang Health Center. And then, based on the result of the statistical test using the chi square test with p-value 0.0 Five, five, it can be concluded that there is no significant relationship between alcohol consumption and the incident of hypertension in Balikambang Health Center. And the next is based on the result of statistical test using the chi square test with p-value 0.001, it can be concluded that there is a significant relationship between sodium intake in the incident of hypertension in Balikamba Health Center. And based on the result of statistical tests using the chi square test with p-value 0.001, it can be concluded that there is a significant relationship between stress and the incident of hypertension in Balikambang Health Center. And moving to the chapter six, the discussion. The first is research limitation. Respondent education level is mostly respondent with low education. Also many respondent are at least so they need assistant in filling out the questionnaires. <clears throat> the next of discussion of this Research result is the characteristic of respondent identity, uh, which is age, gender, and education. Age, the result showed that the majority of respondent age were early at the lead. And the gender, the research result showed that most of the respondent in this study were female, which is so, uh, this is aligned with the research by Patarani et al. in 2018. And education, the research of this study showed the most recent education of respondent is low level education. This is in line with the research of BINU in 2017. Both the, the results of bivariate analysis, the relationship between obesity with hypertension incident results showed that there was a significant relationship between obesity and the incident of hypertension. Obesity is the accumulate, acc accumulation of excessive fat that can interfere with health excessive body weight, make it difficult for a person to move early. Difficult, uh, so it can cause the heart to have to work harder to pump blood and can cause an increase in cardiac output so that blood pressure increase. And this is aligned with Nurita in 2018. And move to the relationship between alcohol consumption and hypertension incident. The results showed that there was no significant relationship between alcohol consumption and incident of hypertension in Balikama Health Center. This is in line with Herman Nurse in 2016. And move the relationship between sodium intake and hypertension incident. The results showed 
that there was a significant relationship between sodium intake and the incidence of hypertension. Sodium consumption can cause the extracellular sodium concentration to increase. Sodium will be extracted throughout the kidneys. If the excretion exceeds the threshold, the kidneys will retrain water to neutralize sodium in the vascular until the increases in intravascular fluid volume will increase blood pressure and that causing hypertension. And this research is in line with related research conducted by IUVT in 2017. And relationship between stress and hypertension incident, the result showed that there was a significant relationship between stress and the incident hypertension. This is in line with the research of Apsari et al. in, in 2019. And the last chapter is closing, which is conclusion. Based on the result of this study, it was found that there was a significant relationship between obesity and the incident of hypertension at Balikambang Health Center. There was a significant relationship between sodium intake and the incident of hypertension in Balikambang Health Center. And then there was a significant relationship between stress and the incident of hypertension at the Balikambang Health Center. And there is no significant relationship between alcohol consumption and the incident of hypertension at the Balikamang Health Center. And the frequency distribution of characteristic in respondent at the Balikamang Health Center is the majority of the elderly, early elderly age, which is 46 until 55 years. And the gender is mostly female. The majority of respondent have low education and suggestion, which is for health center, for public, for education, and for researchers. And then, this is the reference that are used in this research, and this is the end of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the presentation, Miss Siti. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now come to the question and answer session. You can write down your name and your uh, institution name. After that, you you can write about your question. Maybe one until two questions for from the participants, please. Okay, one question, Miss City, from Sinta. There are results that. Gender also affects the occurrence of hypertension in this study. Baik, ya, uh, excuse me, I want to answer with Hasa. Uh, Oke. Okay. Ya. Jadi di sini itu untuk hipertensi itu memang sangat mempengaruhi ya untuk laki-laki dan juga perempuan, tapi lebih banyak untuk laki-laki. Dan di penelitian saya ini lebih banyak perempuan yang terkena hipertensi dikarenakan di sini itu banyaknya lansia untuk usia yang penelitian saya ini. Dan biasanya kalau untuk laki-laki itu apa lebih tinggi terkena hipertensi dikarenakan laki-laki itu punya uh, banyak seperti sering merokok dan lain-lain dan wanita itu mempunyai hormon yang mana sebelum sebelum apa belum masa menopause itu mempunyai hormon yang uh, bisa menghindari hipertensi tersebut gitu sedangkan dalam penelitian saya ini dari usianya itu usia yang dibanyakan usia yang lebih uh, yang sudah menopause jadi lebih banyak terkena hipertensi itu pada wanita seperti itu jadi oke okay. Thank you for the explanation, Miss Siti. Maybe is there any question again before we watch next video? Okay, if there is no question, thank you, Miss Siti. For, thank you, Miss Maya. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now we can watch the next video. Uh, it is from Niken, Kanti Putri Nastiti, are you ready, Miss Niken? Yes, I am. Okay, the topic is about determination of flavonoid levels in ethyl acetate extract of lime peel. Now we can watch the video. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Niken Kanti Putri Nastiti, and I am from Stikas Mitra Keluarga, majoring in pharmacy. 
Today, I would like to serve you my research about determination of levonite levels in acetyl acetate extract of lime peel on the first International Allied Health Student Conference in 2021. This presentation has a four sections. The first section is abstract. Second section is introduction. The third section is method and discussion. And the last section is conclusion. Let's move to the first section is abstract. Lime plant is one of Indonesia's endemic plants, which has been widely used as a medicinal plant. It's known that the content of secondary metabolites owned by lime plants, one of them is flavonoids. The purpose of this study was to find out the levels of flavonoids in lime peel extract. Lime peel extraction used a method of maceration with acetyl acetate as a solvent. Determination of flavonoid levels in acetyl acetate extract of lime peel using the colorimetry method with aluminum chloride as a reagent and using quercetin as comparison standard at a maximum wavelength of 430 nanometers with an operating time of 50 minutes. The average total of flavonoids contained in acetyl acetate extract of lime peel is 0.64%. Percent, with the value of SD is 0.0133 and the RSD value is 0.029%. Let's move to the next section of this presentation, introduction. Oxidative stress is a condition where antioxidants in the body are unable to neutralize the increased concentration of free radicals that exceed normal conditions. According to the result of basic health research by the Research and Development Agency or RKD in 2007, oxidative stress is the main cause of death from degenerative disease, including stroke by 15%, tuberculosis and hypertension by 6 until 7%, diabetes mellitus and tumors respectively each of 5%. We all know that antioxidants are substances that can prevent of slow damage to cells caused by free radicals. According to the research of Erguder in 2007, we can get antioxidants from nature, uh, such as flavonoid, vitamin C, and vitamin E, and an antioxidant synthetic like 4 hexyl resorcinol But in 2015, the Silva said that the use of synthetic antioxidant have a negative impact to our body. So I think it's necessary to find herbal ingredients that have the potential as antioxidants. One, this, one of the substances that can act as an antioxidant is flavonoids. According to the research of Nasucha in 2019, said that lime peel was known to have a high antioxidant activity with 39,000 and 41 ppm of IC50 value as a very strong category of antioxidant. Based on this previous research, I got interest in determining the levels of flavonoid in lime peel extract using acetyl acetate as a solvent extracted by maceration method, tested with UVV spectrophotometers and aluminum chloride colorimetric method. Let's move to the next section about lime peel and flavonoids. As an Indonesian endemic plant, lime fruit has been widely used as an herbal or an additional in food and beverage. Based on the research of Putra in 2018 and Sidana in 2013, in their research that the use of 70% ethanol in lime leaves indicates the presence of flavonoid content. Flavonoids are one of polyphenolic secondary metabolites that can be found and widely distributed in plants. Flavonoids have antioxidant activity. It acts as a free radical catcher because it contains hydroxyl groups. Flavonoids can be used as hydrogen donors against the oxidant. Quercetin is one of flavonoid compounds in vegetables or fruits that also has the potential as an antioxidant. This potential is indicated by the position of hydroxyl group that is able to directly catch free radicals. Quercetin has the strongest anti-radical against hydroxyl, peroxyl, and superoxide anions. Let's move to the next slide about maceration and UVV spectrophotometers. Extraction is a separation process.
assisting the separation of substances from matrix. Restoration is one of extraction method that has been used to extraction the thermolabile active ingredients like flavonoids. UV spectrophotometers is an active analytical instrument that has been used to analyze the level of substances like flavonoids with principle of Lambert beer. The principle says that when monochromatic light is through a medium, in this, in this case is solution, then some of the light is absorbed, some reflected, and some is emitted. And the maximum wavelength of flavonoid is 430 nanometers. Let's move to the next section of this presentation is method and discussion. In this research, the method is quantitative with design of research is experimental. The research was conducted in laboratorium of pharmacy in Stikas Mitra Kwarga, and the lime fruit were obtained in traditional market of Bekasi. The next, the first step of my research is determination test. This, the purpose of this test is to ensure that the plant are actually the lime fruit and to avoid an errors while taking and collecting sample. This test was conducted in Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI, Bogor, Indonesia. The result is the name of samples that I use in my research is citrus as aurantifolia. The next step is extraction of lime peel. Oven dry two kilograms of lime peel at 40 degrees until the moisture content of synthesia is under 10% and powdered with a mechanical grinder, which was then subjected to extraction which, with maceration using ethyl acetone. The extraction process was repeated one time at different periods or remaceration. Extracts were then and concentrated to the dry mass with the aid of rotary evaporator and water bath at 50, 50 degrees. And it, the solvent of the solvent of the extraction is ethyl acetate. The moisture content of uh, Simplicia is seven point three four percent, and the mass of concentrated extract of lime peel is two point sixty two grams. The next step is determination of total flavonoids. The total flavonoids measured by addition of aluminum chloride one percent and potassium acetate in what. 120 millimoles with 500 microliters each reagent to the solution containing 250 ppm of extract. Absorbance was measured again the, the blank at 430 nanometers and results were given as a quercetin equivalence. Standard curve was prepared with five concentration of quercetin. This is the result of maximum wavelength of quercetin. I got 430 nanometers, and the absorbance is 0 0.793 of quercetin. And this is the standard curve of quercetin. And this is the total flavonoid of lime peel extract. I did three times replication. Uh, there are absorbance it's each replication and level of flavonoid in ppm and level of flavonoid in percent and i got the average of level of flavonoid in percent is 0 0.64 okay this is the last section of my presentation conclusions this study has gathered many experimental evidence This study has gathered experimental evidence that ethyl acetate extract of lime peel contains 0.64% of total flavonoid. This study will be very helpful and requires a further research on the potential of lime peel as a herbal medicine. Okay, that's all my presentation for today. I hope you get some many benefits and important information from this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Stay healthy and happy. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Niken, for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, now come to the question and answer session. You can write your name and your institution at chat column, followed by your question. Maybe one or two questions first. 
from the participants. Okay, uh, the first question from Asifa. I want to ask you, why are you choose maceration as your extraction method? Thank you. You can answer it directly, Miss Niken. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Shifa. Uh, I would like to answer it. Uh, why I choose maceration as my extraction method? Because extra uh, maceration is a simple method of extraction. Uh, in maceration, you don't need a specific instrument. And of course, because in maceration, you don't need to use a high temperature as the, during the extraction process. So it saves the extraction, the thermal bile substances like flavonoid. Okay, thank you for the answer. The second question from Cinta. Will you determine the flavonoid levels of lime acetate extract using aluminum trichloride colorimetry method? Why don't you use another method, Miss Niken? Thank you for the questions, Tinta. Uh, I would like to answer it. Why I use uh, aluminum chloride colorimetry method in my research because uh, this this method is uh, common use uh, when you want to determine flavonoid in some extracts. Uh, and in colorimetry method, uh, there is one another uh, reagent that you can that we can use, like two point four dinitropenyl hydrazine. But this reagent is only to identify a certain types of flavonoid. So I use the aluminum chloride as my reagent because it can uh, determine the flavonoid, kind of flavonoid in general. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the answer. Maybe as the last question from Shahla, I want to ask you, based on your research, what is the function of aluminum chloride and potassium acetate? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Shahla, for your questions. I would like to answer it. Uh, well, uh, the function of aluminum chloride and potassium acetate is uh, uh, on my research. While I put the aluminum chloride and, and potassium acetate on my extract or even on my quercetin uh, solution, there's a complex reaction that's characterized by uh, color changes in my sample into pale green. And in this case, the green uh, color reaction occurs due to, to the oxidation reduction reaction between flavonoids and aluminum chloride, where flavonoids uh, act as a reducing agent and aluminum chloride uh, as a oxidizing agents. And the addition of potassium acetate this, uh, serves to detect the presence of seven hydroxyl group. That's all, Miss. Okay, thank you for the answer. Maybe uh, one question again from Miss Dede. I want to ask why only use one one type of lime in this study? Is it only in the flavonoid content of quercetin that is measured? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miss Dede. For as uh, for questions, uh, I would like to answer the first questions. Uh, why only use the uh, because the reasons why I choose the lime peel extract because um, I use it uh, almost in every day, <laughs> and I I have an interest in hairball. That's it. And for the second question, I think uh, because I want to measure the flavonoid, uh, honestly, honestly, in lime peel, there are so many substances uh, such as vitamin C and the others. But uh, in my research, I only focus on flavonoid level. I hope it can answer your question, miss. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Miss Niken for the answer and the explanation. Maybe uh, there is any question again? Okay. If there is no question, uh, maybe we can watch the next video. Thank you very much, Miss Niken. Now we can uh, come to the next session from Helviana Maria Krista Abur. Are you there, Miss Helviana? Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the topic is about analysis of caffeine levels in Arabica de Caffeination and Robusta sold on marketplace using UVV spectrophotometry method. Now we can watch the video. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Helviana Maria Krista Abur. I'm a student from Stika Sumtra Kuarga, Bachelor of Pharmacy Study Program. This is a great opportunity for me that I can be an oral presenter for the first International Allied Health Student Conference 2021. Today, I'm going to present you about my research with the title Analysis of Caffeine Levels in Arabica the Caffeination Coffee and Robusta Sold on Marketplace A Using UV Visible Spectrophotometry Method. Uh, before, I, want, I would like to thank my mentor, she is Ma'am Melania Purwitasari, who has helped me for the research process. So now, let's get started for the presentation. Here is the background of my research. According to the Center for Agriculture Data and Information Systems in 2016, the coffee area in Indonesia was 1.2 million more hectares. And uh, the two types of coffee with the largest land area are Robusta and Arabica. Uh, in coffee, one of compounds that uh, we know is caffeine. Caffeine, according to TJ and Raharji in 2016, said that caffeine can give a positive impact to the body, namely get rid of drowsiness, pedu, etc. But if you consume over the dose, caffeine give a negative impact to the body, namely heart palpitations, headaches, restlessness, etc. Because of negative impact to the body of caffeine, and because of people have a low tolerance with caffeine, so there is an innovation to reduce caffeine in, in coffee products, which is called the caffeine the coffee. So based on the background that I uh, that we talked about before, there here is the research proposes first to determine the amount of caffeine content between the caffeinated robusta coffee and the caffeinated arabica. Second, to find out whether the caffeine content in one serving of the caffeinated coffee products is in accordance with the dosage requirements based on the Indonesian national standard. Third, to prove that the UV-visible spectrophotometry method can be used in determining caffeine content in the caffeinated coffee, which can be seen based on the results of method validation. The next slide is about method and steps. For the method that I use is UV-visible spectrophotometry. And here is the steps for this analysis. First, qualitative test. For the qualitative test, I use peri method. And second, qualitative test. For quantitative test, there is many steps in here. First, prepare standard solution. Second, uh, determine maximum wavelength. Third, determine calibration standard curve. And the last one is determination of caffeine content. Another one is metal validation. Uh, there is a uh, some parameters of method validation, uh, selectivity, linearity, accuracy, precision, LLD, and LLG. The next slide is the result and discuss. The picture number one and number two are, are samples. And in these samples have a change color to green. If we compare with the positive content number three has a change color to. So it, we can conclude that in the sample have uh, have been caffeine as a component. The next slide is about maximum wavelength. The obtained wavelength is 274 nanometers. And if we compare with the theoretically according to Billy at all uh, 200 at uh, 2008 in far to 2018, that is for caffeine's wavelength is 272-270 nanometers. These wavelengths can be accepted 
because according to Canada in 2004, for acceptance condition for the youthful range have to plus minus one and a of the theoretical maximum of land. And the next one is selectivity. For the, for the selectivity, we can we can see uh, we can see in this curve. For the curve among the caffeine standard, Arabica and Robusta has a since have a similarly uh, curve. From this point, we can uh, have a conclude that uh, in this method can be selectivity, we have a good selectivity to analyze, analyze the analyte. Next slide is standard curve and linearity. For this uh, standard curve, I use uh, five, five uh, series concentrations. For the three replications and the coefficient of determination uh, effort the term of determination that I got have a average 0 0.9989. And uh, if we compare with the uh, the theoretically uh, according to Bender and Roman in 2012, the terms of the coefficient of determination have to more than equal to 0 0.997. So the next slide is about accretion. In this table, we can see for the three level concentration, half a percent recovery, half a range percent recovery is on 94.47 until 100.37. From this data, we can result, we can uh, conclude that the result of this data indicate that the data obtained are in accordance with the acceptability requirements for recovery. That uh, according to Harmida, in 2004, namely for the analyte concentration, you need 1 ppm until 10 ppm, which is 80 until 110%. The next one is precision. For the three level concentration with three uh, replication, half of percent RST, uh, half of wins percent RST is uh, 0.3% uh, until 0.7%. So here is the, the next slide is about LOD analogy. For the lowest concentration of analyte that is still detectable by the instrument or LOD is 0.3822 microgram per milliliter. But for the lowest concentration of analyte in the sample, which is still determined with acceptable accuracy and precision or LOD is 1.2739 micrograms per milliliter. The next slide is about determination of caffeine content. For the uh, sample Arabica and Robusta have a have a phrase content is uh, are 0 0.8946 uh, 0 0.8647 percent and uh, 1.6214 percent. But if we compare with the standard caffeine content in the caffeinated corn coffee, uh, According to Ramotsmi and Rakhavan in 1999, is half to less than 0.3%. So the next slide is about amount of caffeine consumption per serving. For the caffeinated Arabica and the caffeinated Robusta, uh, half uh, in one serving or in 10 grams or of uh, coffee have uh, eight. 86.47 milligrams of uh, con caffeine content and for robusta have uh, for the robusta has 160 162.414 milligrams of uh, caffeine but if you compare with a uh, indonesian national standard uh, this caffeinated product has not shown a good standard of the community coffee so this product can endanger public health, especially consumers who have a low tolerance for caffeine. So here is the conclusion. First, the sample of the caffeinated coffee brand X contained caffeine with an average level of in uh, levels in Arabica coffee is uh, 0.8948% uh, uh, and Robusta is uh, 1.6214%. And for the caffeine level in one serving of both the caffeine coffee products are not in accordance with Indonesian national standards, namely for Arabica, 86.47 uh, milligrams and Robusta is 
162.14 milligrams, but the required Indonesian st national standards is 50 milligrams per serving. Third, the UV visible spectrophotometry method can has met the method validation specifications on several parameters, namely, the recovery range is uh, 94.47 until 100.37%, uh, and RSD 0.3% until 0.7%, and linearity with a coefficient of determination or R square is uh, 0.9989. And for LOD is uh, 0.3822 gram per milliliters. And for LOQ uh, is 1.2739 gram per milliliters. Okay, thank you, Ms. Helviana, for the presentation. Now it's time to question and answer session. You can write down uh, your name and your institution below at chat column followed by your question. Maybe one until two question first, first. Okay. From Sinta, what wavelength was used in the study? Why use that wavelength? Miss Helviana, maybe you can answer it directly. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> so for we uh, choose the wavelength for uh, analyze, analyze the analyte. For the first, we have to um, uh, determine the wavelength in uh, instrument spectrophotometer. And uh, there is, we can see the maximum wavelength. And the, the maximum wavelength that I uh, used is uh, 274 nanometers. And after that, uh, with the uh, the wavelength, we analyze the samples and the cool standard and our standard solution with the uh, that uh, wavelength maximum wavelength. And why I use the wavelength is because uh, if we compare with the theoretically, uh, for cancer analysis is uh, in we have a range in put. 272 until 273. So that's why I choose the 274 for the uh, wavelength maximum for analyze, analyze the analyze. That's my answer. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Silviana, for the answer. On second question from Slede from Stikas Mitra Kuarga. The first question, what's the difference between regular coffee and the caffeinated coffee? And the second question, what are the effects on the body if you drink coffee too often? Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the question. Uh, so I will, um, I'm going to answer your question. For first is what, what is the difference between regular coffee and the caffeinated coffee. So for the caffeinated coffee is, uh, uh, regular coffee is, uh, have, a, on, uh, have a level of caffeine. Yeah, yang, uh, I want to combine with bahasa, sorry. Uh, jadi kalau untuk uh, coffee, kopi yang biasa, itu dia dari hasil dalam proses berbentuk, apa, berbentuk bubuknya itu dalam caffeine yang, uh, yang apa sesuai gitu. Sedangkan kalau untuk dekafenil kafe itu sudah melewati proses untuk mengurangi kadar kafein di dalamnya. Dan untuk dekafenil kafe ini banyak uh, prosesnya itu bisa menggunakan uh, untuk metodenya bisa menggunakan distilasi air, uh, or pelarut organik dan lain-lain. Dan untuk pertanyaan kedua, what are the effects on the body if you drink coffee too often? So uh, maybe for uh, for individu it will be different uh, different for different effects for the body. Jadi kalau misalkan uh, ada beberapa orang yang mungkin kalau memiliki toleransi yang kuat terhadap kopi atau eh, terhadap kafe, kafein, um, misalnya dia sudah sering mengonsumsi kafein tersebut, dia bisa saja walaupun dengan dosis yang tinggi pun dia tidak merasakan uh, efek tersebut karena ini uh, perbedaan dari banyak faktor dari Uh, dari genetiknya atau dari kebiasaannya untuk mengonsumsi kafein seperti itu. Oke, okay, any other question again? 
for Ms. Helfiana. If there is no question, thank you, Ms. Helfiana, for joining us to seminar today. Now we can watch the next video from Fabriana Lulu Safitri. Are you there, Ms. Fabriana Lulu? Yes, Ms. Maya. Okay, thanks. Uh, now we can watch the video. The topic is about appropriate use of anti-diabetic anti drugs evaluation in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients at installation of a private hospital in East Bekasi region in 2020. Maybe we can watch now. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sadia Nawawi Sapitri, student from Sekes Mitra Keluarga, majoring in Pharmacy Bachelor Program. And I'm here to present you about appropriate use of anti-diabetic drugs evaluation in type 2 diabetes mellitus patients at installation of a private hospital in East Bekasi region in 2020. This presentation is divided into five parts, their background, literature review, research method, result and discussion, and the last conclusion. And I will open this presentation with paper. Indonesia is seven rank of 10 countries with the most DM sufferers, which is 10 million sufferers. Indonesia is the only country in Southeast Asia that gives high contribution to the prevalence of DM cases in Southeast Asia, in for that in 2020. One of the most common cases of DM is DM type 2. The proportion of DM type 2 cases is 95% of human in the world, data 2017. DM in an emergency can cause several complications. The mortality rate is 8 million in 2000 and 21 million in 2013, and in 2006. Therefore, it is necessary to evaluate the set of drugs in GM type 2 patients. There are two purposes of this research, namely general objective and specific objective. General objective to evaluate the use of anti-diabetic drugs in GM type 2 patients and the specific objective the first to analyze the rationality of anti-diabetic research, there are right indication, right medication, right patient, and right dose. The second specific objective, to know the pattern of anti-diabetic research in type 2 GM patients. The next slide is literature review. GM is a group of metabolic disease with hyperglycemic characteristics that occur due to abnormalities in insulin secretion, insulin action, or PATH, Perkini 2015. TM is classified into four, namely TM type 1, TM type 2, TM gestational, and other TM. TM type 2 is characterized by insulin resistance and relative insulin deficiency. The cause of TM type 2 is due to an unhealthy lifestyle. All of types of GM will receive pharmacological or non-pharmacological therapy so that the patient by sugar level can be controlled. The next slide is research method. Design study, descriptive observation with a retrospective approach. Price study, one of the private hospital in the East Bekasi area and the study was conducted in February 2021. Population, all patients with a diagnosis of type 2 GM who are hospitalized at a private hospital in the East Bekasi area. The sample taken were patients who meet the inclusion criteria, the first patient with a diagnosis of DM type 2 with or without complication at 20 until 79 years, and the last receiving oral anti-diabetic therapy, insulin, or a combination. The sampling technique used is non-probability sampling with consecutive sampling type, Sastro Asmoro 2011. The next slide is result in discussion. Based on the research that has been done, it can be seen that there were 54 patients with GM in a private hospital in the East Bekasi area during 2020. 48 patients meet the inclusion criteria set by the researcher and the six patients include the exclusion criteria because the patient did not receive anti-diabetic treatment. The next slide, characteristic by gender. 
from the total sample that obtained, as many as 48 patients with GM type 2, 20 patients were male with a presentation of 43% and 28 patients were female with a presentation of 58%. From the result obtained, women are at risk of developing DM that men. The result of this study were in line with Hong Dianto that the prevalence of DM in women is higher than in men because physically women have a greater chance of increasing BMI postmenopausal multi-cycle syndrome, which can cause fat distribution to be more accumulated. However, men are also at risk of developing TM if there are excessive levels of the hormone testosterone in the body, which will cause fat accumulation in the abdominal area so that it can cause obesity. Lockway 2004. The next slide is characteristic by age. Its data is used to determine the number of TM patients in adult and chariotics. Age is one of the risk factors for TM. The result obtained where the age range with susceptible to TM was 41 until 50 years, which is the percentage was 38%. The result of the study were in line with no rule that the highest age range of age of TM type 2 patients was 41 until 65 years as much as 77%. Increasing age of a person will increase the risk of TM, especially at the age of more than 40 years because at that age there is an increase in glucose intolerance and the aging process causes pancreatic beta cell to decrease insulin production. Trisnawati 2013. The next slide is characteristic based on comorbidities. In table one, we'll know the distribution of patients with or without comorbidities. Obtained that 43 results with comorbidities and five without comorbidities. In table two, the distribution of patients based on the type of comorbidities. The most common comorbidities were hypertension. TM type two is a risk factor for uncontrolled hypertension because the M type 2 affect the increase in renin angiotensin aldosterone, salt and fluid retention, and vascular stiffness, so that it can increase blood pressure. It's anti-arrhenia 2017. The next slide is anti-diabetic drug use profile. In the hospital, the author studies there were two patterns of administration, namely single and combination. For the single administration pattern, the cause of drugs used are sulfonyl ureas, GPP for inhibitor, and insulin. While the pattern of administration in combination there are three, namely a combination of insulin with insulin, combination of oral with oral, and the last combination oral with insulin. The most widely used was combination of insulin with oral as many as 21 patients. The next slide, evaluation antibiotic drug use. The evaluation used in this study is that there are four criteria. The first was, uh, the first was strike indication. The result obtained that 100% was proper. The second was strike medication. The result obtained that 58% was proper and 42% was improper. The next criteria is right patient. The result of time, 100% was proper. And the last criteria, right dose. Uh, the result of time, 98% was proper and 2% was improper. The last slide is conclusion. The profile of anti-diabetic use in one of the private hospitals in the East Bekasi area in 2020, we can conclude that the most widely used medication in, the, in drug in combination, the most the least usage was insulin with insulin, then the combination oral with oral, and combination oral with insulin. The next conclusion, the result of the evaluation of therapy for DM type 2 patient at a private hospital in the East Bekasi area in 2020 will know from 48 patients with 100% right indication, 58% right, 58 right medication, 
100% right patient and the last 98% right dose. This is reference for this presentation. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. And thank you, uh, Miss Febriana Lulu, for the presentation. Maybe there are questions for you. First, from Aldila, what is meant by non probability sampling with the type of consecutive sampling? Maybe you can answer it directly. Uh, okay, thank you for your question, Aldila, and I will try to answer. Uh, non probability sampling uh, with consecutive sampling type is that the samples taken are all observed, uh, subject, and have met the inclusion criteria. Thank you, Aldila. Okay, thank you for the answer. The second question from Helen How do you determine the right drug? Uh, thank you uh, for your question, Helen. Uh, uh, determine the, uh, the right tracks in the in this research uh, by comparing the high ba one c values uh, of patients with the algorithm listed in Perkin 2011 and uh, American Diabetes Association 2018. Thank you. Okay. The next question, wow, very, very much question for you, Fabriana Lulu. Uh, the next question from Mega Chahiani, I want to ask you, why is there an incorrect dosage? Okay, Mega, thank you. Uh, because there was one patient who used the drugs Trajenta Duo, uh, the dose was not in accordance with Perkini standards, uh, with the dose so we five milligram, but the patient is taking 7.5 milligram. Thank you. Okay, uh, next from Ajeng. I'd like to ask why in the age range taken from 20 until 79 years for the inclusion criteria. Okay, thank you, Ajeng. Uh, because uh, this is an, this is, uh, accordance with InfoDatin 2020, which states that the countries with the highest GM cases are Arabs, Africans, and the West Pacific. The most uh, vulnerable age is 20 until 79 years. Okay, thank you for the answer. Maybe it's the last question. From Sinta, what are the factors that affect right medication only? 58.33%. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Sinta. Uh, because uh, I will try answer with Bahasa. Uh, uh, karena ada beberapa pasien yang nilai HBA 1 c itu uh, tidak sesuai dengan algoritma yang sudah di pada Perkini dan uh, American Diabetes Association. Sehingga hasil untuk tepat kodatnya itu yang tepat hanya 58 ke Thank you, Sinta. Oke, okay, thank you. Maybe another question. Okay, if there is no question, thank you very much, Ms. Febriana Lulu for joining this seminar. And now uh, we move to another video from Sukma Widayani. Are you ready, Miss Sukma? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the topic is about appropriate use of oral antihypertensive drugs evaluation in non-dialysis chronic kidney disease patient of private hospital in East Bekasi from 2018 until 2020. Okay, let's watch the video.
To me, this is, is one of the biggest cause of death in the world. What actually happened? It is because of the human lifestyle that unintentionally damage kidney function, or because the treatment is not appropriate. Hello, everyone. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sukmawin Dayani. I am the author from this paper, and the paper title is Appropriate Use of Oral Antihypertensive Drugs Evaluation in non dialogic Chronic Kidney Disease Patients of Private Hospital in East Bukhasi, 2018-2020. Let me start by giving you some introduction about this topic. In 2014, a survey conducted by Pernefri or Indonesian Nephrology Association estimates that around 12.5% of the population or 25 million Indonesian had decreased kidney function. Meanwhile, West Java has the highest prevalence of chronic kidney disease or CKD in Indonesia. Hypertension is caused an effect of kidney disease and contributes to its development. As GFR decreases, the incidence and severity of hypertension increases. On the other hand, from the therapeutic perspective, lowering blood pressure can slow the decline in GFR and delay the development of ESRD. Of the two statements lead to antihypertensive drugs themselves can be used in patients with kidney disease for other purposes. In addition to lowering blood pressure, this therapy can also slow the progression of kidney disease in patients with or without hypertension. Then question arises, how the appropriate use of oral antihypertensive drugs evaluation in non dialysis chronic kidney disease patients of private hospital in East Bukasi, 2018 to 2020, seen from the right patient, right medication, right medication and right dose. Turning our attention now to the theory, I'd like to illustrate this point by showing you this chart. Chronic kidney disease is grouped into five categories, namely categories five, categories one into five. These five categories cause decreases kidney function. The most common etiology of kidney disease is hypertension. Many CKD patients receive hypertension therapy because of the antihypertensive function itself. The therapy is defined into two, namely neuropharmacological therapy and pharmacological therapy. Let's move to the methodology. The study used is observational retrospectively, which means the researcher looks at the data that is already available, in this case, the medical record data. The time of the study is February until March 2021. The place of research in, is in a private hospital. The population taken is all patients diagnosed with non dialysis chronic kidney disease, and the sample were taken from 50 patients who meet the inclusion criteria. Then, how to take a sampling method? The sampling method is non probability side namely consecutive sampling, which means that all objects that meet the criteria are then included in the sampling size until the number of size is met. The next slide is about results and discussion. Start with gender, age, and then comorbid. Most of them are male, as much as 68% and 32% as male. According to research concluded by Anita 2020, the urinary tract of men is longer than women, so the resistance to urine output is higher. Other data from England is that female patients are 10.6% more than male, much as 5.8% patients suffer from chronic kidney disease. Next is about age. In terms of age, in the age range of 486 to 59 years old, patients suffer from CKD. This is because in old age, anatomically, the growth ability of kidney cells begins to decline. Kidney function also begins to decline. Plus, comorbid. According to the table in addition to the most comorbid experience by CKD patients are NIDDM or non insulin dependent diabetic mellitus. 
28% and higher than 24%. Impaired insulin action causes complication in the eyes, nervous, blood vessels, and kidneys. Hypertension itself causes uh, damage to the glomerulus due to high blood pressure. To the next slide, we'll see drug use profile. The antihypertensive group used in the hospital is ACE, ARP, CCB, diuretic, beta blocker, and central alpha agonist. Combination treatment is more prescribed than single treatment. The most commonly prescribed combination drug group is the CCB combined with ARB and diuretic group. And the single most prescribed drug is amlodipine. And now we come to the evaluation of appropriate after use. This evaluation came from the right patient, right indication, right medication, and right cell. To begin with, I will discuss the right patient. Right patient taking individual contraindication into account, such as in treatment and lock testing. In this study, the patient accuracy was 100% correct because it had no contraindication. Second, the right indication. By looking at the blood pressure value, if the blood pressure is below 1960s of millimeter of mercury or hypotension, it can say to be inappropriate indication. In this study, there was one patient with a low blood pressure who received oral antihypertensive therapy. So the presentation of science means 8% correct indication and 2% incorrect indication. Third, the right medication. By looking at the administration of therapeutic group, either singly or combination by considering the diagnosis. In this study, 86% of the drug were correct and 14% were incorrect. It's said to be inappropriate because according by Lucella 2020, in the management of the KDM amlodipine, therapy should be given alone without an SAE or uh, RD. Last point, we talk about right self. So this analysis by comparing to line folks and management of the KD. It occurred 94.84% right dose and 5.16% wrong dose. Why is that? Because of the total 155 drugs prescribed, there were eight drugs that need dose adjustment, but in this case, the dose was not adjusted. Appropriate use of oral antihypertension drugs evaluation in non dialytic chronic kidney disease according to the right patient is 100%. Right indication is 98% correct. Right medication is 86% correct. And right dose is 84.84% correct. And yeah, our recommendation is based on the research that has been done, it is advisable to do further research on the correction for patients with chronic kidney disease. It aims to improve the quality of patient health where the drugs prescribed are in accordance with the patient's physiological condition, which can reduce the risk of USRD or insect renal disease. So yeah, that's all my presentation. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the presentation from Ms. Sukma. Now we come to question and answer session. You can write your name and your institution name at chat column followed by your question. Maybe one until two questions first from the participants. Maybe one question. Okay. Uh, the first question from Mega Cahyani. Hello, Sukma. I want to ask you. There are six classes of drugs used in the hospital. I already explained what drug classes are often. 
please give an example of the medicine. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mega, for the question. I will answer your question first. Uh, the question is, they are in the crisis of drug use in the hospital, as I already explained it. What drug crisis are often please give and explain in medicine? Um, they are six classes drug use in hospital, as I already explained it. Uh, what drug classes are often combined? Uh, the most widely used drug classes combine of uh, this research is CCD and IV or amlodipine combined with semitalcan. They are also more than two combinations that are CCD and IV is combined with diuretic or amlodipine with semitalcan plus prosemid. That's the most drug prescribed by the doctor in this hospital. That's it, Mega. Okay, thank you for the answer. Uh, so much question for you today, Ms. Sukma. Uh, the first question, I'm sorry. From Sinta, what are the factors that affect right medication only? Uh, I'm sorry. What are the factors that affect right interval time in administration? Just 65.21%. I'm so sorry, Vicinda. The interval time administration yeah. 50, 65.21% yeah. is. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm combined with Bahasa. Itu di okay. bagian mananya ya? 65,21%. From abstract, your abstract. My abstract. Because I'm not used interval time okay. the right interval in this research. Oh, in, in this research, uh, there's no interval time. Yes. Okay, maybe we can skip this question. And from Fadil, why antihypertensive drugs are related with, with CKD? Okay, thank you, Fadil, for this question. Uh, the first is explain is in the background that hypertension is cause and effect of the KD. This means that when GFR decreases, the severity of hypertension is increases. When hypertension is present, the risk of developing hypertension is increases. In this addition, the mechanism of hypertension medicine itself, it can lower blood pressure. Hypertension drugs are also renoprotective or protect the kidneys with various mechanism depending on the cause of each drug. That's why hypertension and CKD are so closely related. That's it, Miss. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Sukma, for the answer. The next question is from Aina. I want to ask about the drug accuracy. Why amlodipine cannot be found alone? Okay, thank you, Ms. Aina, for the question. According to Lucella in Management of the KD 2019, the CCD drugs group are, are in this case amlodipine, so not be prescribed without a CE or IMV. Because uh, the use of amlodipine alone cause can cause hyperfiltration in greater albuminuria. Hypertension agents, ICE and ARD, are very effective in slowing uh, the progression of CKD disease. If these two groups are no longer effective, then ACCD or TIAZID can be added. But giving amlodipinolone is not recommended. I know. That's it, man. Okay, is that clear? That's clear, Aina. Okay, maybe just one question again. From Fabriana Lulu, I heard that in the right dose section, there are eight drugs that were not dose adjusted. What should be the correct dose adjustment? Okay, thank you for the question, Fabriana Lulu. The such adjustment needs to be met that so that the effective the therapy is achieved, minimize the incidence of toxicity, and prevent a decrease in kidney function. 
but there are some tracks which according to the manual uh, do not need to be adjusted by looking at the GFR function. For example, if the GFR is less than 10 mg per decibel, then some tracks need to be adjusted. For example, captropyl, disoprolol, and ramipril. Besides these drugs, the dose does not need to be adjusted. No, this dose adjust can be done by entering the GFR value into the curve code formula. They, there is already calculating itself. So you can uh, you can enter in the GFR value to a curve code formula. That's it. Okay, uh, thank you Sukma for the explanation. Maybe uh, the time is over for your session. Now we can watch the next video. Thank you so much Sukma for, attend and for attending for this time. seminar. Now we can watch next video from Miss Dilawati. Are you ready Miss Dila? Yes, I am. Okay. The topic is about oral anti-diabetic usage evaluation in type 2 diabetes mellitus in patients of Hospital X at East Bekasi region using observational description method in 2019 until 2020. Now let's watch the video. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say thank you for coming to my presentation. It's great to see you all. Okay, let me introduce myself. I'm Dilawati, student from Stikas Mitra Keluarga Bekasi majoring in pharmacy. I will present you all about our research. The title is Oral Anti-Diabetic Usage Evaluation in Type 2 Diabetes Mellitus in Patients of Hospital X at East Bekasi Region Using Observational Description method in 2019 until 2020. The sub-discussion that I will discuss is first background of the research, second grand theory, third research methodology, fourth result and discussion, fifth conclusion. Let's start with the first slide which is background of the research. Diabetes mellitus is called the silent killer because this disease can affect all organs of the body and cause various kinds of complaints. According to the International Diabetes Federation Atlas, in 2017, Indonesia was ranked sixth in the world with 10.3 million people with diabetes. While diabetes itself in Indonesia is ranked third as a disease that is the biggest cause of death in Indonesia. Uncontrolled diabetes will lead to complications of other diseases such as hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, retinopathy, neuropathy, stroke, and diabetic ulcer. One of the most important factors causing this complication is the use of inappropriate drugs or irrational use of drugs. Next slide is about grand theory. Diabetes mellitus is a disease or chronic metabolic disorder with multiple etiologies characterized by high blood sugar levels accompanied by impaired carbohydrate, lipid, and protein metabolism as a result of insulin function insufficiency. Diabetes mellitus is divided into three, namely diabetes mellitus type 1, 2, and gestational diabetes mellitus. Type 1, diabetes is caused by an autoimmune reaction in which the body's immune system attacks the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas. As a result, the body produces very little or nothing. According to Dipiro, in 2015, a person was diagnosed with diabetes mellitus if the A1C was more than 6.5% or more. Fasting blood glucose was 126 mg per dl or more. Temporary blood sugar was 200 mg per dl or more. The therapy used in the treatment of diabetes mellitus can be used in two ways, namely therapy without drugs and therapy with drugs. Then, 
There is the rational use of drug that aim to ensure the patients the patients get treatment according to their needs. Drug use can be said to be rational if it meets one of the criteria, namely the right indications, the right dose, and the right time interval for administrations. Next slide is research methodology. The research design I use is descriptive observational testing using uh, retrospective data. The time and place is March 2021 until April 2021 at the X Hospital, East Bekasi Region. Population and sample is all patients uh, at the X Regional Hospital of Bekasi Timur who were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus who were included in the inclusion criteria. Sampling method all patients, all the uh, X Regional Hospital of Bekasi Timur who were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus who were included uh, in the inclus in the inclusion criteria. Next. Next is result and discussion. It can be seen in the table that the most at risk of developing type 2 diabetes mellitus are are female that then male with the age of 31 to 60 years the most common comorbidity suffered by type 2 diabetes mellitus patients in this hospital is essential primary hypertension The profile of the use of oral antidiabetic that are most widely used in this hospital if the sole treatment is a sulfonyl urea antidiabetic and combination therapy that is often used is antidiabetic sulfonyl urea plus biguanid plus DPP4. From the table uh, on the evaluation of the use of oral antidiabetics, we can see that the use of antidiabetic drugs in this hospital has the right indication, which is 100%. From the second table, we can see the, the, accurate, the accuracy of the dose given in this hospital for our antidiabetic treatment is 91.30%. This is because six out of 69 patients receive the wrong dose or overdose. The daily dose used in this study referring to AHFS 2011 and Parkini 2015. For example, patient uh, X received Trajenta Duo at a dose of 7.5 mg per 1.5 g per day, while according to AHFS in 2011 and Parkini 2015, Trajenta Duo could be given at a daily dose of 5 mg per 1 g. In Table 3, we see that the accuracy at the time interval of giving oral antidiabetics in this hospital is 65.21%. And the last slide is conclusion and suggestion. First, the highest single use of the sulfonyl urea group was 72.22%. While the highest oral Antidiabetic combination therapy was the sulfonyl urea plus biguanid plus DPP4 group with a percentage of 33.38%. Second, the most common comorbidities found in, in patients type 2 diabetes mellitus who receive for antidiabetic therapy at X hospital is Bekasi where essential primary hypertension. Third, the result of the study on the evaluation of the use of oral antidiabetics in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus with or without comorbidities 
in the inpatient installation of the East Bukasi Regional X Hospital in 2019 until 2020 can be concluded that the percentage of case of indication accuracy is 100%. Accuracy in doses dosing by 91.30%. And accuracy of the interval of drug administration by 65.21%. Suggestion further research should be car carried out more deeply on gender, age, comorbidities suffered by patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and on the evaluation of drug use because with further analysis on this it can improve patient health and higher rationality in patients with diabetes mellitus anti-diabetic treatment enough of my presentation thank you very much for your great attention assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh thank you miss Gila for the presentation now it's time to question and answer section you can write your name oh um, there is question for you first from miss valeriana why there are mostly women diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus than men thank you uh, okay valeriana thanks for your question I will answer it. Uh, why there are mostly women diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus than men? Because women basically have a higher chance of being overweight or obese. Uh, this is uh, reinforced by research conducted by Trish Nawati in 2013 that women have a monthly cycle, postmenopausal, which makes the distribution of body fat easy to accumulate due to the hormonal process. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss Dila. Then the next question from Mega Cahyani. I want to ask you what is the first treatment for diabetes mellitus? It's the same question uh, like Fabriana Lulo. So you can answer to both of them. Thank you, Dila. Okay, uh, thank you for Mega for the question. I will answer it. Uh, the first treatment is non drug therapy, namely calorie uh, restriction to lose weight. Exercise, exercising regularly can lower and keep blood sugar levels normal. In principle, there is no need for heavy exercise, like exercise as long as uh, it is done regularly will have a very good effect on health and oral monotherapy. Uh, if this does not work, the drug therapy is carried out namely for type 2 DM patient with HbA1c when ex 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 examined more than 7.5% uh, or patient who have first type monotherapy within three months but cannot reach the HbA1c target of less than 7%, then a combination therapy of the drugs was start consisting of metformin plus other drug with different mechanisms of action. Example, metformin from the guanid group combined with a glimpirate from the sulfonyl urea group. A, combi a combination of three drugs needs to be given if after three months of therapy two kinds of drugs do not reach the HbA1c target of less of less than 7%. Okay. The next question from Aina, what is the difference between type 2 and type 1 di uh, diabetic? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Aina. Uh, between uh, different between diabetes mellitus type 1 and 2 uh, is type 1 diabetes is caused by an autoimmune reaction in which the body's immune system attack the insulin producing beta cell of the pancreas. As a result, the body produces 
uh, variolator or nothing. Well, type 2 diabetes in when the body does not use insulin properly and cannot maintain blood sugar at the normal level. Type 2 diabetes usually occurs in adults and more often occurs in people who are overweight or obesity. Type diabetes 2, formerly known as diabetes adult onset or diabetes non, not insulin dependent. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for the answer. And maybe it's the last question from Sinta because the time is over. Why in the combined use of sulfonyl urea, biguanate, and DPP4 group just 31.38%. Okay, uh, I will answer it with bahasa. Uh, karena yang paling banyak digunakan di rumah sakit itu adalah uh, dia single, tidak kombinasi seperti itu. Makanya kenapa penggunaan antidiabetik oral kombinasi antara sulfonil, biguanit, dan DPP4 itu rendah. Terima kasih. Oke, okay, thanks for your explanation. Now, uh, we move to next session. Mr. Raju, are you ready? Thanks, Ms. Pila, for the presentation and discussion for today. Hello, Mr. Raju, are you here? Hello? Raju, can you hear my voice? Hello, Mr. Raju. Your name is in the room, but we can't hear your voice, Mr. Raju. Okay, maybe we, okay. Mr. Raju, can can you answer my question first? Are you ready? Can you answer my question first, Mr. Raju? Maybe your audio is broken or something trouble? Because there's question and answer session. Okay, maybe we can move to the next video. Uh, it's okay, Mr. Raju? Because I can hear your voice. Okay. Are you ready for... Ready, ma'am. Okay. Now we can watch the video. Greeting to all. My Greeting to all, my name is Raju Sumanto and I will present the result of my crush heart disease compression with the title Analysis of Patient, patient Satisfaction with Pharmaceutical Service at a Private Hospital Pharmacy Installation in S. Bekasi. Research Background Pharmaceutical Service in Hospital are in are an inspired part of the health care system in hospital. Improvide the performance of pharmaceutical service in hospital, patient satisfaction is an important thing before. It is necessary to measure patient satisfaction with pharmaceutical service. 
formulation of the problem. Are our patient satisfaction with pharmaceutical service on the five dimension, namely reliability, responsive, assurance, empathy, and tangible evidence at the pharmacy installation of a private hospital in Asbekasi? Which of the five dimension has the highest level of satisfaction in the pharmacy installation of the private hospital in S. Bekasi. Theory review. Pharmaceutical service, dimension of circle of or quality of service, patient satisfaction. Pharmaceutical service. Pharmaceutical car is a process the evolves the management of pharmaceutical Prefatation and clinical pharmacy service wake aim to identify, provide and resolve drug problem and head related problem. Patient profession of information about drug as a management of monitoring drug hours as main Reading to all, my name is Raju Sumanto, and I will present the result of my crush.
Ladies and gentlemen, we apologize for the inconvenience. Please kindly to wait because we have some troubles. And please continue the session in each breakout room. Cut this compression with reading to all. My name is Raju Sumanto. And I will present the result of my crush at this compression with the title Analysis of Patient Patient Satisfaction with Pharmaceutical Service at a Private Hospital Pharmacy Installation in S. Bekasi. Research background Pharmaceutical Service in Hospital are in are an inspired part of the hall car system in hospital. Improvide the performance of pharmaceutical service in hospital, patient satisfaction is an important thing before. It is necessary to measure patient satisfaction with pharmaceutical service. Formulation of the problem. Are all patient satisfaction with pharmaceutical Service on the five dimension, namely reliability, responsive, assurance, empathy, and tangible evidence. At the pharmacy installation of a private hospital in Asbekasi. Which of the five dimensions has the highest level of satisfaction in the pharmacy installation of the private hospital in Asbekasi? Theory. Review pharmaceutical service, dimension of circle of or quality of service, patient satisfaction. Pharmaceutical service, pharmaceutical car is a process the evolves the management of pharmaceutical privatization and clinical pharmacy service, which aim to identify, provide, and resolve drug problem and head related problem. Patient. Profession of information about drug as a management of monitoring drug hours as main of guidance and counseling. Dimension of circle or quality of service. Circle or service quality is any activity or benefit offered by one party to other. Quality is something that must be done well so that so that the quality of service is measured far in achieving excellence. The severity of a service depends on the quality show whether it is in accordance with customer expectation and they share or not. Dimension of circle or demand or quality of service. 
one reliability the ability of provide service as from site excel accuracy and reliability responsive the ability of provide service for customer quickly and accurately empathy politeness concise and the ability to, to give trust and trust to the service provide to customer assurance giving sign card and individual or personal intention gave to customer by trying to understand customer desires tangible the ability of a company of to provide suggestion and facilitas they can be filed by customer satisfaction the customer respond the cost of evaluation and the free files this fancy between profiles expansion and the actual performance of the product file after house to the emph the emotional response failed by customer when they enjoy the experience of using or consuming product or service three satisfaction filled by patient is related to the the comparison between expectation and reality in a service provide conceptual framework pharmaceutical service at a private hospital in sbkc variable x reality response insurance empathy and tangible or patient satisfaction at a private hospital pharmacy installation in sbkc variable e Research method of frog study, descriptive quantitative DVN and data ratio, primary data, data collection instrument questionnaire, sampling method, non probability sampling, weight and shading sampling method. Respondent 96. Population of patient who read them grow at the hospital, primary C, pharmacy installation. Research method. Tier of tier of fresh instrument, validity, validity test, reliability test, data processing, computer program, Microsoft Excel, and SPSS, SPSS 22 program, data analysis, univariate analysis, G square test, inclusion, exclusion criteria. Inclusion criteria fashion IT until 60 year can communication rate and right will fashion are willing to be respond criteria exclusion criteria one fashion will come from employees employees of a private hospital in Sbekasi to elderly Fashion. Jadi fashion with disabilities for the fashion cannot more body far for value. Fashion who are illiterate, illiterate, and have difficult communication. This and time race. The flies. This race was condition at the primary installation of a firm private hospital in Bekasi time IT March 2021 until 40 April 2021 research overview subject characteristic of respondent by gender number of women 5, 51% Number of mine forty nine percent. Characteristic of respondent by eight. Thick as in the egg, right? Three thirty thirty one until forty. Offer of rest subject characteristic characteristic of respondent based out education junior high school two comma 
19% senior high school 20 26% big holler 71,9% characteristics of respondent by expectation PNS 3% XTC 29 26% swasta or viral swasta 71% overview of patient satisfaction percent of service quality dimension based on figure 5,1 the highest percent of service quality is the dimension of empathy and the lowest in the dimension of assurance present discussion post tabulation on of patient satisfaction at a free fight hospital pharmacy installation in S. Bekasi. Beside on the result of the C square test, the V value of S dimension in the table below is obtained. Therefore, the P value less than P value 0.05, then HO is reject and has is accepted then it is stated that there D is an effect of service quality on patient satisfaction calculation beside on the result of the g square test the v value of reliability is 0.002 Responsive is 0.00, assurance is 0.002, empathy is 0, 0.034, 0, and tangible is 0.008, and because the p value less than v value 0.05 is it is tiny the three the third is an effect of fashion certification on the five dimension the installation private hospital primary in is Bekasi in 2021 of the five dimension the empathy dimension greatly affect the satisfaction of operation at the pharmacy installation of a free fight hospital in S. Bekasi with a percent of IG 4.63%. Suggestion for hospital concrete. For service, they are already good. They are minded and I find improved too. It is half the, the the hospital will increase the number of pharmacy personnel to encourage the spite of service as financially cannot draft. It is half the there will be availability of drug information in the waiting room. Serve us drug big horse, drug life place, and banner. For the next section, in is how the is rest will be perfect as will as the styling and definishing, defining the problem related to pharmaceutical service. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Mr. Raju. Maybe one question for you, any question? Are you there, Mr. Raju? Hello? 
Okay. Um, maybe any question for Mr. Raju? Okay, uh, maybe just one question for you. What are the dimensions of reliability, responsiveness, assurance, empathy, and tangibles that most influence patient satisfaction and how to improve it become 100%? You can answer it directly, Mr. Raju. Yes, ma'am. Uh, bahasa Indonesia aja nggak apa-apa, Bu. Oke, okay, it's okay. Uh, kalau dari kan udah baik, saya akan menjawab. Uh, dari kelima dimensi hasil penelitian saya itu dari pertanyaannya kan menyangkut uh, pengaruh dari kelima dimensinya itu berkaitan ya. Sebenarnya dari kelima dimensinya itu saling berhubungan. Jadi salah satu dimensinya itu kalau memang tidak baik, jadi salah satunya enggak juga bakalan baik juga. Jadi saling-saling, jadi sepertinya saling berkaitan. Oke, okay, that's all, Mr. Raju. Apa sih? Uh, uh, that's all. Or maybe you want to... Answer again? No? No, Bu. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Raju, for your presentation and discussion. Now, on next video, from Miss Aina. Are you there, Miss Aina? Hello, ma'am. Sorry uh, for the no uh, about the noises, but I'm here. I'm ready. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you can hear my voice. Yes, ma'am. I can okay. hear your voice clearly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the topic is about synergism test of that and raw tempe on antioxidant activity. Now we can watch the video first. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to say sorry if there is some noises in here, but I hope you can still hear my voice clearly. How are you guys? I hope you all stay healthy in this pandemic situation. Allow me to thank you for the time has given to me and let me introduce myself. My name is Aina Sofanarani. I'm a student from Stikas Mitra Keluarga. On this occasion, I will present a pharmaceutical science journal entitled Synergism Test of Deaths and Raw Tempe and anti uh, on Antioxidant Activity by Intan Kurnia Putri and myself, Aina Sofanarani. Well, On 2019, there was public consumption that if we eat that and tempe together, it's really good for health. And on 2010, Irina has researched that raw tempe has an antioxidant activity, also on that. On 2019, Nur said that that fruit has a high antioxidant activity. Linda on 2017 said that the combination of two types of antioxidant can increase the antioxidant effect, as well known as synergistic effect. Okay, from this background, then the problem arise. What is the, con uh, the concentration of antioxidant activity on that, and then on tempe, and then how is the effect of that and raw tempe that consumed together on the synergistic effect of antioxidant activity? So from this research, we got hypothesized, which is zero hypothesized. There is no effect of that and tempe that consumed together. And for alternative hypothesized, it's the opposite of the zero hypothesized. So let's moving on to the methods, results, and discussion. In this research, the samples that we used were methanol extracts of dates and tempe. For dates are purchased from Tanah Abang, Jakarta. We use sukari types of dates with rooftop maturity level. And for tempe are purchased from Cibuntu Tempe Factory, Bekasi. We use plastic wrap tempe with three days of fermentation. 
and this research we use direct experimental laboratory design with pro prospective data collection located at Stikas Mitra Keluarga Laboratory in March 2021. Well, this is the ingredients and instrument. I use methanol pro analysis as a solvent. Okay, first step. We did determination test to see the correct identity of the plants that are used. We only test on that because tempe is soybean that already done fermentation process, so it doesn't need to do a determination test. The result shows a plant that are used is that with Latin name Phonix dactylifera. Next, we did preparation of that extract. First, we dried that in an oven for about uh, 10 hours at 80 degree and dried dates are mashed using a blender. That's powder that we got we soaked in methanol for two, uh, two days and then the maceration is filtered and the filter uh, is filtered and the filtrate is evaporated for three hours. And we got the dates extract yield of 8.82%. Next, we did preparation of tempe extract. Uh, first step is we chop the tempeh and blend it until it becomes porridge. And then the porridge soaked in uh, methanol for a day, and then we did the remaceration for a day. And then after a day, the remaceration is filtered and the filtrate is evaporated for three hours. And then we got the tempeh extract yield of 5.25%. So it is the organoleptic data. We use three parametric, which is uh, form, color, and odor. And that extract has thick form with black brown color. Then the temp extract has liquidy form with yellow color. And both of them has their own special smell. Next, we did a water level test to the samples to ensure that the water content contained in the sample doesn't exceed the limit. So the water content doesn't interfere with the test process. And we got the water content on tempeh extract was 43.32% and that extract was 5.88%. So for a qualitative test uh, was carried out by phytochemical screening for flavonoids. As you can see, from uh, that, we got the color sample change into black color after adding FECL3. And on tempe, the color change uh, into green black color, which means both of them has uh, have a positive result. So this is the reaction of phenol compounds with FECL3. The colors change that occurs due to the formation of a complex of phenol with uh, Fe3 plus ions. Next, before we test with DPPH method, the DPPH liquid must be tested on spectrophotometry UV visible to know absorption of, uh, absor uh, the absorption area. By the test, we uh, obtain a wavelength of 515 nanometer uh, with an absorbance of 0 0.586, which is really great because the absorbance is on the range. And this is what happened when the DPPH meets the antioxidant compound. Mm. The color change of DPPH from violet to yellow is due to the hydrogen or electron donation mm. process, and then followed by the uh, a decrease in the absorbance of DPPH. Next, we did operating time test on DPPH to get reacted with, uh, with vitamin C. This test to see how many times the test compound could uh, react stably and got the result, DPPH can react stably at 25 until 40 minutes. For the standard curve, we use vitamin C to see the linearity of the relationship between concentration and absorbance. And we got the R value was 0 0.99, which is really good. And the use of vitamin C for control positive is to determine how strong the antioxidant potential in the methanol extract of deaths and tempe compared to the vitamin C. And as we can see, this is the antioxidant activity test. As we can see, both samples has inhibition value close to vitamin C, which means both of extract has a high antioxidant activity. And if you realize, tempeh extract has a higher uh, inhibition value. This is because tempeh contain compound factor 2, a glucan compound factor 2. This compound is only found in fermented soybeans. For the synergism test, 
we did seven formulation with different ratio and we got the result F4 formulation 4 with 50-50 ratio has a higher inhibition value. And statistical analysis was conducted to see the effect of the combination of DETS and TEMPE. And statistical analysis was carried out using a simple linear, linear regression analysis method because there was only one variable. In linear regression analysis, we only focus on two tables, namely the summary model table and the coefficient table. From the model summary table, uh, we can see our square value was 0 0.575, which means the independent variable affects the dependent variable by 57.5%. Uh, From the coefficient table, we can see that the strength of the independent variable affects the dependent variable by 170%, where this is when we saw from the regression interval table, the value of 170% is in the range of more than 80%, where the strength of the independent variable affects the dependent variable is very strong. All right, from this research, it can be concluded that the death had antioxidant activity with an inhibition value of 24.52%. And then Tempe has an inhibition value of 39.99%. And the results of statistical tests using the simple linear regression method show that there is an effect of deaths and Tempe consumed together to increase antioxidant activity. From this research, we suggest to test uh, the antioxidant activity using the other test methods. And for the research, uh, can be done such as clinical trials with mice or the manufacture of the such formulations. And when you use the PPH as the test methods, you have to be careful because the PPH test material is unstable to air and light. So it is my pharmaceutical science journal. I hope you can get the benefit from here. If you have any question, you can ask me. Thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Miss Aina, for the presentation. Maybe just... Uh, maybe to be more effective, just one question for you, Miss Aina, from the moderator. Why you use the, the, the PPH method? Is there any other method for this test? Okay, uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. Um, I will answer directly. Um, I use the PPH method because um, it is easy to do and it has as accuracy that we require than the other methods. And indeed, it, uh, it has uh, some many methods to test antioxidant activity, such as uh, FRAP, uh, FRAP, and many more. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe it's uh, the time is over for the next question. So thanks, Ms. Aina, for joining the seminar today. And uh, now we can watch the last video for this session from Ms. Mega. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the topic is about the potency of binahong leaf ethanolic extract as inhibitor of Staphylococcus aureus. Now we can watch your video first. Good afternoon, everyone. Many thanks to all of you for being here today in this wonderful place. My name is Mega Chayani, and I'm a student from Stikas Mitra Kolega. I'm the author of this paper, and this paper titled The Potency of Binahong Leaf Ethnolic Extract and Rendila Polyphoria as Inhibitor of Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, let's go to start. Infection diseases are diseases by microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, and virus. This is one of the main health problems in developed and developing countries. The Ministry of Health in 2018 reported that the incidence of infection in a hospital was around 3 to 21%, with an average 
of 9% or more 1.4 million hospitalized patients. One of the bacteria and cases infection is Staphylococcus aureus. Treatment of infection cases by bacteria can use antibiotic, but over time, the problem of resistance arises because of the high use of inappropriate antibiotic. According to CLSI 2016, antibiotic oxacillin and penicillin are resistant to Staphylococcus aureus. Based on this data, it is necessary to search for bioactive compounds that have the potential as antibacterial binahong is a perennial or long-lived creeper plant. According to the part in 2015 explained in his research that binahong leaf andre dera polyphoria contains flavonoid, alkaloid, terpenoid, and saponin. This is uh, these compounds are compounds that have antibacterial activity. This is supported by precious research. Hardiana in 2019 explained in her research that binahong leaf extract with a concentration of 100% was able to inhibit Streptococcus mutans with an inhibition to a diameter of 5.5 milliliters. Research on this antibacterial activity of binahong leaf and the content of secondary metabolite has been carried out. However, research using concentration Variation has never been done before. The purpose of this research is to determine the effect of ethanol extract of binahong leaf and the codifolia on Staphylococcus aureus. And the hypothesis of this research is the administration of ethanol extract of binahong leaf with concentration of 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, and 100% was able to inhibit the graph of Staphylococcus aureus. And next, extraction 100 grams simplicia powders was soaked in 500 milliliters of 9,6 ethanol. The solution is stored in an aluminum and closed for five days. After five days, the sample was filtered, producing filtered one and residue one. Residue one was soaked again with 253 milliliters of 9,6 ethanol and closed. After two days, the sample was filtered, producing filtered two and residue two and mixed together. The sample was evaporated using a rotary evaporator so that the minohong leaf extract was obtained. The extract was put into a water bed and evaporated until all of the ethanol solvent and evaporated. The thick extract is weighed and stored. Test solution preparation, positive control use sterile aquadis, negative control use chloramphenicol antibiotic D, 30 microgram, and extra concentration, concentration solution of 20%, 80 20%, 40%, 60%, 80%, and 100% ethanol extract of binohong leaf. And next, antibacterial test. For bacteria that have been incubated for 24 hours are made into a suspension and then the turbidity is compared with the standard McFarland. Static cotton swab is deep in bacterial suspension and then strike the agar plate manually and incubated for 15 minutes. That put the this using tweezer and then incubated and 37 for 20, 24 hours. This is antimicrobial agent, resistant less than 12 millimeter, intermediate 13 to 17 milliliter, susceptible more than 18 milliliter.
The following is the result of measuring the diameter of the crowd inhibition zone of Staphylococcus aureus. Based on this data, it is now that the diameter of the crowd inhibition zone after being given the ethanol extract of vinyl leaf with various concentration level indicated the resistant category. The following is the diameter of the inhibition genine obtained from a concentration of 20% to 100%. The following is the diameter of the inhibition zone of the positive control and negative control. It is known that the positive control diameter results are in the sensitive category. One-way ANOVA test, based on this data, it was shown that the result of the one-way ANOVA test on the binaholic ethanol extract treatment graph result in a significant value of 0 0.0. This is indicated that there is a significant difference in the average diameter of the Staphylococcus aureus inhibition that between the positive negative control group and the concentration of the extract. Binahong leaves are grown to contain flavonoid. It is now the, film, the flavonoid have antibacterial activity. Based on the result of the Staphylococcus aureus crowd diameter, it saw that there is a significant difference, but it is still in the resistant category. This is might be due to flavonoids are not the dominant contents of binahong leaf. Uh, based on the result of my explanation earlier, it can be concluded that higher the concentration of ethanol extract of vinyl leaf, the greater diameter of Staphylococcus aureus growth inhibition zone, the higher concentration of the ethanol extract of vinyl leaf, the greater diameter of the Staphylococcus aureus growth inhibition zone. And that bring you to the end. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Okay. Uh, thanks, Miss Mega. For thanks, Miss Mega, for your presentation. Maybe we can go to answer and question session. Okay. The first question is from Putri Aisha. Why you smack Farlan as comparison? Thank you, Miss Mega. Can you answer it? Uh, okay, thanks, ma'am, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, and thanks for the question, Putri. I want to ask all your question. Uh, the McFarlane standard was used to estimate bacterial concentration density. Standard McFarlane 0.5% is equivalent to 108 colony farming units per milliliter. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Maybe just one question, yeah, from the moderator. We use chloramphenicol as positive control. Can we use other uh, antibiotics for your research? Hmm. Permisi, Ibu. Saya izin menjawab dengan menggunakan bahasa Indonesia, ya, Bu. Oke, okay. go ahead. Uh, karena uh, pada penelitian saya untuk kolam penikel itu menggunakan uh, dis yang 30 mikrogram dan itu uh, antibiotik itu kan dari langsung ke sintetiknya jadi hasilnya positif lebih besar dari yang variasi konsentrasinya karena yang uh, dari konsentrasi itu kan ada berbagai senyawa jadi uh, tidak langsung ke satu senyawa spesifik dominannya itu Bu terima kasih Okay, thanks for, for your explanation, Miss Mega. Uh, now it's time to close the last session for today. All participants, please come back to main room for closing ceremony. There will be announcements from the best oral presentation today. And please 
uh, fill the link attendance for today's presentation in column chat. Wait for a second. Don't forget to fill the link to get your certificate. Okay. Now the link is in the column chat. You can fill it before we going to main room. Okay. Thanks for your attention and for all participants who have attended this seminar from yesterday until now. I apologize if there are mistakes in my words while being the moderator for today. I hope all participants are always in good health and we can meet at the next seminar in Stikas Mitra Keluarga. Thank you all. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now we can join to main room. See you again.